Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for joining. My name is Tiago Carvalho. I'm the Graduate Studies Coordinator at the Champalimau Foundation, and I'll be chairing today's session. I want to point out before we start that I didn't organize today's session. Uh, every, everything was done by the wonderful Laura Ward, who coordinates um, our Eurochair project, which is um, the um, EU parent structure, uh, and with, which is helping us uh, fund these uh, educational efforts and, and several others. Um, we, we are going to have the pleasure today of, of hearing Bernd Pulver speak. Uh, Bernd is uh, the head of scientific publications at EMBO. It's a family of journals that, um, that of course, he will, he will tell you a bit about um, and a bit about of the, uh, on the role of academic uh, innovation. And uh, the, the title, I think, is, is, very, is, is very exciting. Uh, hopefully, you're producing reproducible data before you come to the publication crux, but definitely there are things that we can do on the, uh, on the publication and to improve it. Um, Bernd has been um, with EMBO, I believe, since 2009, if I'm not mistaken, after essentially a decade at, at Nature Journal, first at Nature and then at Nature Cell Biology. And he's a biologist by training. I believe Bernd his PhD at the Ludwig uh, on Cancer bi Biology. And I'm not going to take up a lot of his time. I just want to say one brief thing, which is please put your questions, if you can remember, in the Q&A box. We'll be asking them at the end, unless something is uh, pressing and on fire through the middle and generating a, a misunderstanding. Um, we would rather if you identified yourself and in institution and, 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 and if you're a student or a postdoc, just because one thing that we really miss in these uh, Zoom seminars is getting to know who we're speaking uh, to. Uh, of course, if you are not comfortable with that, that, that is welcome as well. But uh, um, without further ado, I'll turn over to, to Bern. Thank you very much, Bern, for doing this. And welcome. Well, thank you, Thiago, for the kind introduction and <clears throat> Laura and Adriana for the invitation. Um, I was meant to be there physically, so I'm here metaphysically now and hope to be in Lisbon again uh, as soon as possible, uh, because it's much nicer than here, <laughs> that's for sure. So, and, and I've never visited actually some of the institutes, so I'm going to be very excited to come again if I'm invited after this talk. So I, I'm going to do, um, I've been asked to focus a little bit on uh, various different uh, new policies and platforms we've been developing. Uh, but what I will say is uh, really not meant to be a sales pitch for anything EMBO does, but sort of be a general paradigm for how selective high quality pub publishing and open science platforms can work co-jointly to come to a better system of scientific dissemination. And then I've been asked at the end to give a 10 minutes um, overview of editing as a career. So, so I will, I've taken some slides out of my normal uh, talk, uh, my, my initial talk. And so if that's a little bit um, high level and you have specific questions, please ask because there's not too many details in that talk. So without further ado, I will start to share my screen. Um, hopefully this will work as intended. Can you just confirm that you can see that? Yes, yeah, we Great. I can. Wonderful. Okay. So so I'm gonna cover a few topics today. Um, and and they revolve around the transparency of the journal process that we and other journals try to um, cultivate. Um, this is different to open openness. Um, I'm gonna try to, to touch on openness in various different aspects of open science. <clears throat> I will then come also to research integrity because that's an issue that we um, find ourselves facing increasingly at the journal level, even though as, as Thiago pointed out, this should really not be an issue at journal level, it should uh, be sorted out upstream, but it ends up not being sorted out upstream. So I hope this is useful to sort of alert you some of the issues. Um, in, I want to cover how we can increase efficiency of the process. Uh, we talk very briefly about research assessment as a driver of a lot of these issues and then switch to the careers. So um, transparency is uh, basically the transparent review process. In terms of op openness, I will talk about open data, preprints, but also touch on open access. I won't spend details on that. If you have questions, please ask me afterwards. We'll talk about pre-publication uh, screening of, of the literature and uh, a constructive correction process if there's time and then um, journal independent peer review platform we've just set up. 
So uh, without further ado, I just, in terms of introduction, I'm the chief editor of the EMBO journal. I'm also responsible for the five journals that uh, EMBO Press publishes, um, of which three are open access on the right-hand side. I think the titles speak for themselves. Uh, Life Science Alliance is a new journal we launched together with Rockefeller University Press and Cold Spring Harbor University, um, a lab press, I should say, um, which is uh, a nice way to illustrate, I think, that things can be done collaboratively, and not in competition all the time. Uh, we're quite proud of that journal, so I'm going to show you one slide on that. Um, in terms of uh, EMBO Journal and EMBO Reports, they are what's called hybrid journals, so they have an open access option. Most people in Europe now choose open access, and in fact, more than 50% of the papers in the journal are open access. So you can see there's a real shift towards open access um, in the literature. So now I'm finding that I'm struggling to move my slides. Oh yeah, that works. So uh, just in terms of background, we had last year the 500 uh, year anniversary of Leonardo da Vinci. And I, I want to use this to illustrate uh, where, where we've come from. Basically a uh, scientific, um, dissemination was really based on, on people's diaries uh, of, of uh, artists and, and uh, scientists and cultivated people who were observing nature and chronicling what they saw, but essentially for themselves. Uh, and uh, it took the Age of Enlightenment, that means the 17th century, um, largely in Northern Europe at that point, to, um, to move things forward into a more systematic way um, to basically try to have mechanisms of communicating from scientists A to B or B to A here, um, a specific discovery in a sort of systematic way. And, and the importance of this was really uh, summarized very well by Isaac Newton, who said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, which is a lovely quote to say, you can only really progress through collaboration. And uh, this then led to the more formal launch of, of what we call now research journals um, very soon after the Newton quote. And you can see um, competition already existed in the, at that time, within three months of each other in Paris and London, the two first scientific journals um, were launched. Although it has to be said, the London version is slightly more systematic and, and possibly it could be called more serious than the, than the Paris version. Uh, this then led to the um, second innovation much, much later, 300 years later, in fact, which was the concept that you can actually feedback from, from reader A to, to author B um, and this was initially, of course, very informal. This was done through, uh, through a meeting up in the Royal Society in London um, over a good stiff whiskey and a cigar, essentially, and, 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 and discussing research papers back with the authors because they were all members at the time, of course. Um, and this then formalized in the 1960s into a, into a peer review process uh, where, where several peers would be would be assigned, and this was really the innovation of the Royal Society in London, to, to, to assign uh, two or three expert peers to write formal reports on a specific paper before they were accepted for publication. Um, and this is where we are still now, and the question is if we can move the next step, and this is what we call open science, and I'm going to try to illustrate a couple of mechanisms that go beyond journals in a second. So, so what are peer-reviewed journals really for? They're, they're there to filter um, and I think it's obvious to everyone that they, or essentially all scientific journals try to filter for quality of the science that's been um, shared. Um, they're also meant to filter for reproducibility of the science. So that means that others can read the paper and reproduce the research. Now there's many hurdles in the real world to that. And um, there's a reproducibility crisis, what sometimes is called a reproducibility crisis out there. That's partially due to the fact that um, the research papers are written in a way that's inherently not very reproducible. And the methods we have are not protocols. The data we have in papers are not real data, but, but uh, condensed versions of data at best. So there is an inherent problem um, at the level of dissemination in terms of reproducibility. And there's also a problem that we're not really um, set up to share science in a constructive way because we're in a very competitive system where people also intentionally hold back data because they want a competitive advantage. So that's something we really have to address. And we as journals have an obligation to try to share data in a way that is reproducible. However, journals like the EMBO uh, press journals, but also Nature um, or, or Cell or Science or the Journal of Cell Biology where Thiago was before, uh, actually he was at the Journal of Experimental Medicine, sorry, um, are obviously 
also selecting for other factors. And these are sort of summarized by the words interest and novelty. So, so we are trying to filter out the most exciting signs and the best signs at the same time. And why is this important? We're doing this because uh, we're trying to get people to browse information across their specific subject niche. If it, you're only intent on reading papers in your uh, exact expertise, of course, it would be quite easy to go onto PubMed or Google Scholar and just do um, key keyword-based screens and you would have the all literature at your hand. But you see that uh, the graph here shows that the literature overall has exploded since I was doing my PhD in the 90s to uh, really near exponential or fully exponential growth until very recently where it's started to flatten off a little bit. So, so this, is, uh, this has led to a massive shift on, on being able for, for single human brain to absorb all the information in your field to, to that being entirely impossible even within your field. And um, it's certainly impossible to browse around the subject area. And that's where we feel that journals do play an important role because they allow you to still um, engage in browsing. Uh, why is journal selectivity important? I just want to give you one single example. It's, uh, it's from the more medical literature um, under the heading extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So this is the, um, the infamous Wakefield paper, Andrew Wakefield, who published in the Lancet in 1998 that, uh, that he saw a correlation and he never claimed causation of the MMR vaccination in kids with, uh, with a syndrome that he equated with, with, um, with basically uh, childhood behavioral deficits um, or autism essentially. So, so this then led to a huge, uh, huge media uh, splash basically and, and uh, was really the birth of the anti-vaxxer movement uh, as parents were taking their kids off the vaccination. And we all know now that uh, MMR vaccination in many countries has dropped significantly below herd immunity. Everybody knows now what herd immunity is after COVID and uh, the number of deaths from entirely preventable diseases has escalated massively in diseases like measles, which were meant to be eradicated by now by the WHO. So, but interestingly, this paper never said that they proved an association. They, they, they only said that they saw an association and further mechanistic studies would have to delineate if this was, if there was causality. Of course, it turns out that this was never provided. In fact, the paper was uncovered to be entirely fraudulent, flawed and unethically sourced. But it took, unfortunately, a investigative journalist to uncover this, not uh, journal editors, not the scientific community. So this was a complete failure of the system. And furthermore, the journal in this case took 12 years and uh, staunchly defended this paper against retraction. So it took 12 years to let the paper retract it. And that uh, created the vacuum that allowed the anti-vaccine movement essentially to grow. Uh, we have the same Unfortunately, again, in this case, in the Lancet, but all journals have similar problems. So I don't want to just point the finger at the Lancet. Very recently, uh, you've probably all heard of this paper. This is this is, uh, a paper uh, that claimed to uh, that there was no effect of chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine on, on the COVID-19, which is, of course, true. But this paper was a massive, in fact, the biggest ever multi-hospital uh, study that claimed to show this and it presented for the first time a massive new infrastructure in fact that could create clinical patient data um, globally in, in this systematic way so this would have been an amazing resource and alarm bells were not ringing sufficiently so the paper was fast tracked into publication and it turns out that this paper has multiple flaws that could have been certainly seen by referees possibly also by the editors there's a few warning signs within the paper was just one of these too good to be true papers. Nonetheless, it was rushed out because of COVID. This time it was retracted within a few months, so super efficiently. So we've learned something at least from the past, but, uh, but non nonetheless, these papers are still coming out causing massive media splashes. And of course, every single such paper causes a much bigger negative impact than, every, than any positive piece of science that you, that you are able to share. So we, we talked a bit about reproducibility. We talked about scientific integrity, and now I want to come to peer review. Many people feel that the whole process of scientific selectivity in journals is, is not fit for purpose. And I would like to argue that's not the case, but we can certainly improve it. So what can we do actually at journals? We find that uh, 
we can optimize the editorial process most certainly in many multiple ways. And there's more ways than I'm going to present, but, but uh, I'm very interested in your feedback also, because we're trying to be community responsive um, as, as EMBO, we are entirely community responsive in, in fact. And if you have creative ideas, please let us know. I will cover the transparent review process, pre-publication uh, checks that we are applying very, very briefly, and then move into open science and data transparency. So in terms of the editorial process, we essentially have a process that tries to be more optimized for, for time because delay is the thing that people point out most as the thing that's broken. So we have an editorial process that pre-selects papers for peer review. Uh, many journals peer review most of the papers submitted. We have an in-house process with professional scientific editors that all have backgrounds and that's where the career part of the talk will, will, will come into, uh, go into more details. But, but our editors essentially select papers, all the papers that we think have a very good chance uh, to be published and all the papers in fact that we want to publish if they stand up to, to peer review scrutiny. So we end up refereeing about 25% of the submitted papers. And, and uh, this process is in fact very fast it only takes three to four days, uh, working days to, to get you an answer. Now the important thing, the important change is uh, that we try to communicate as clearly as we possibly can. It's difficult given a turnaround time, but we try to communicate clearly what the um, reasons for a rejection are if you get editorially rejected. And after peer review, which takes a month, we try to communicate very clearly what uh, is the reason for rejection, or again, what revision has to be added to the paper and what referee issues were raised do not have to be addressed to submit a revision. And this allows us then to, um, to, do, uh, to encourage what we would call realistic revision. On average, they take us 88 days on three months. And this is a fairly stable number over several years now. Um, so it's what we would call fairly rapid. And we, it allows us to also publish 95% of the, the revised of, of the papers where revision is invited. So, so, so this is almost all the papers. So once you get invited to revised, you essentially are certain to be published in the journal. And we think this is crucially important because it allows you to spend the time to do revision properly. And uh, that then leads to um, a clear acceptance at the end. So there's a commitment to accept the paper if the revision is done properly. Uh, what about transparent peer review? So this is a very simple mechanism we've done for a decade now, which is simply to add all of the referee reports to each published paper. Now, importantly, it's not just the referee reports, but it's also the author rebuttals to the referee reports because we think it's crucial that there's a balance between uh, the expert opinions of the referees and the author's response to them to hear all sides of the coin and also the editorial decision letters and communication between the authors and the, ref uh, and the editors. And this has now led to, uh, to this becoming a standard, which is, which is fantastic. So journals like the Nature Journals have, have adopted this uh, science. So this is becoming um, a really um, nice development across the literature, I would say, in the biosciences. Now, peer review itself is, of course, something that's been um, around for a while. And, and when I said it was developed formally in the 1950s, there was also, of course, informal feedback before that. So here we have Charles Darwin from The Origin of Species where he comments actually within the revised version, as many of you, um, as many have been made by, so, so he, he talks about the feedback he received and why he ignored most of it for the second uh, version of the origin of species. But it would be useless to discuss all of them as many have been made by writers who have not taken the trouble to understand the subject. I think many authors feel the same about referees. That's most unfortunate because we think it's often not, not quite true. Authors will always be fans of their own work of course, otherwise you wouldn't spend all these years uh, doing it. So it's very hard to get a balanced um, and completely dispassionate view of your own work. But we do think it's crucial to have a level playing field and a dialogue between the authors and the editors and also between the editors and the referees. Um, so that al allows the playing field to be overall leveled and not just for the editors to hide behind the referees. So we've tried to achieve that through two different mechanisms. So one is important, uh, the, uh, what we call res referee cross consultation. And again, this is something our journals have done for uh, five years now and other journals are, are adopting it. Um, particularly, you may have heard of eLife, another very good scientific journal that is doing a very similar process now. 
uh, we basically get all the referees to discuss their referee reports between each other in a form that is moderated by the editor before we send an before we make an editorial decision and before we send out the decision to the authors. And the second point is that we have an author pre-consultation process where in all cases that are not black and white, we try to go back to the authors before with the referee reports and say, um, be very useful to hear your views before we make an editorial decision um, to, to see what you would be prepared to address, what you think uh, you would not be prepared to address. Because um, then we can hear both sides of um, both sides um, neutrally make a firm decision and then commit to publication with a proper revision plan by the authors. This uh, seems to work very well. And one thing we learned from COVID is that um, this can be done more effectively even online. So we're doing Zoom meetings now often with authors where we go through the referee reports after they had a chance to read them. And that's a really constructive process. It's, it's never been unconstructive, which is fantastic. We've got a couple of other policies that are useful to mention. Uh, one is the scooping protection that uh, we basically say from the date you submit or now from the date you preprint your manuscript, you're essentially immune from being scooped by, by another journal. That means you should cite the paper if it was published um, ahead of you, but we will not reject the paper for conceptual advance because of this preceding paper. Again, we think this depressurizes the system and gives you the time to actually focus on doing your revisions properly. We have an open, uh, un unlimited reference list, very important because we want people to cite the primary research literature over the review literature and we have open, uh, open reference and now open abstract standard. We uh, strongly encourage preprint posting and uh, data citation and we have uh, uh, citation formats for both of these formal citation formats. So you can uh, really have outputs beyond journals that count as formal scientific uh, outputs because they can be formally cited. We developed a portable manuscript uh, transfer system uh, which is called the Mecca standard together with Rockefeller University um, and others are part of this too now, which allows uh, a seamless uh, transfer from preprints to the journal and from journal and between scientific journals. So that's what we use for our transfers between, between our journal network, which is very small, of course. Uh, we have these uh, four journals. We now have Life Science Alliance on top of it that's really built on this uh, transfer network. And one point I want to make about this is it's uh, not a passive transfer process like you see at many journals. We have an active transfer process with a pre-consultation where the editors of journal A that uh, ends up not being able to publish a paper for specific reasons pre-consult with journal B first and get their view on it and then communicate that view already unless the authors are out, of course communicate that view of the second journal already. So you have basically two different shots at goal in the same process. And this can be applied serially. So from the Ember journal, you may get an offer from Ember reports. And if that doesn't work out because the referees have issues, uh, want further reaching experiments, let's say, um, then we can also offer um, a, a, a second offer from, from Life Science Alliance to publish. So this is all based around getting explicit, explicit feedback on your research paper from a number of different journals that you, and it's entirely optional up to the authors to opt into this. Um, and you get a very clear commitment through, through this informed process, um, which journal actually wants to go for your paper and will go for your paper if the referees um, don't see flaws in, in the data set. Also important, we're trying to, ex or we have extended this beyond our little, uh, little group of journals here to consider any reports from any other journal. And uh, Rockefeller University does this too, for example. You can submit uh, referee reports from any other journal where you're stuck and we will con consider them at face value. With certain journals, we have agreements that we get the referee names, with most of them we don't. So this is what Life Science is about here, the journals that are connected to Life Science Alliance. And I'm gonna move on to preprints now. Preprints are, as you can see, also an exponentially growing enterprise. Um, in fact, they continue to grow uh, very fast, although uh, sub-exponentially now in bioarchives. But instead, uh, MedArchives, which is a new medically oriented version of bioarchives, is growing actually hyper-exponentially at the moment. So it really is a boom time for 
for uh, preprints. It has to be pointed out for 25 years before preprints were completely established in the physical sciences. And we're essentially emulating something that's been complete standard in physics for many, many years. But you can see there's many, many preprints out there. Many preprints at the bottom here, you can see this data is a bit old now, but, but you can see most preprints actually end up getting published 60% in over 400 journals. So it, it really is the first step into journals. You should not be cons concerned that any quality journal will reject your paper because you preprinted it. Here are the numbers uh, from COVID. Uh, there's been a massive surge in COVID preprints. In fact, journals like ours uh, have adopted the Wellcome Trust a call to post everything on preprints, everything COVID related to accelerate the science. And I think we've seen now with the first vaccine phase three trials in, uh, in a speed that has been five times faster than usual vaccine development, how much COVID science has accelerated. Uh, and it's really a remarkable achievement by the scientific community. So we have preprints now layered on top of our little journal network. Uh, and importantly, uh, we allow preprint citation, we allow direct submissions from the preprints, as I mentioned, we link the preprints to the papers and they can be bi-directionally linked back from the journals to the preprints too. Um, and we have this important scooping protection from the day of preprint posting policy, which we hope more journals will adopt. Now, the latest thing in this is that we have the preprint review, reviewed preprint format, where in essence now on bio archives, and I hope other preprint servers will start to do the same. Uh, we can post our preprints uh, through this new standard we developed called TRIP. And we can post our referee comments on the preprint version of the paper. And this is, of course, an important uh, way to try to, to, to annotate preprints also, because as we all know from COVID also, not all preprints are super reliable. So we've, um, we can apply this also to, to your published papers that they're linked back, but, but also to your rejected manuscripts. If you don't make it at Embo Journal, you can post your preprint on the BioArchives version and hope another journal will come in and say, well, these are great referee reports. You will publish your paper based on them. And uh, we developed a third uh, use case here, which is the thing we're most excited about, which is review comments. Very briefly, review comments is a format, a uh, new platform that does peer review irrespective or agnostic of, of the journal destination. Uh, these are all the journals that are member of the, uh, the review comments platform, but the peer review is done upstream of these journals. And basically you as, as an author uh, submit your manuscript to review comments. There's a pre-selection process. The review comments um, editor will then assign three um, expert referees of the sort of level you're used to from EMBO press journals. And you will get those referee comments back as, as the service, basically. Um, you can add your author response to it and then do one of two things, or ideally both, which is to post your referee preprint as from the previous slide on bioarchives and or select one of the journals that are members as your destination. This, these journals will take those referee reports at face value, will not re-review the paper unless there's very specific reasons to get additional advice. They will certainly not re-review the paper. And that's the commitment that they gave. And if it doesn't work out in your journal two of choice, you can then simply click a button and you go to journal four or journal one, and you can do that four times in the process. That's what the review comments is about. Uh, we also trying to use this process to try to maybe go to a place where we have more objective peer review because we feel the referees um, that are working um, outside of the journal system may be more focused on the science in front of them without uh, really thinking about the journal fit per se as a first step. We, th we think this is an interesting experiment. It's run for a year now. We've got more than 300 papers that have gone through the system now. Uh, and we're evaluating if the peer review has, has changed in any way so substantively. We think it's at least as good as the journal peer review, so this is great. We've also tried to structure the reports more to focus the reports on the science more than on the editorial advice referees give. So we hope it's more objective. Few points, um, because I'm not going to try to go too much over time here on data transparency. So I'm switching now to the data in research papers. We feel they're um, long ignored. We focused very much on copy editing and textual optimization in papers for many, many years, uh, whereas the data was always a sort of byproduct that we just slapped into our papers, both as authors and, and researchers. And yet what we're trying to do with research papers is precisely to communicate data, not actually text around data. So we want to represent the data as you see it in lab books in a form that's usable and reusable. That's what FAIR stands for in FAIR data. 
uh, by, by other people. Uh, what you immediately see in typical figures in papers that they're extremely condensed, um, colorful versions that are illustrating essentially the hypothesis you want to bring across to, you, to, to your readership. We have representative embryos here, representative cell nucleus here. Um, everything is representative and, and is not really uh, designed to be extracted and analyzed. So in essence, uh, the figures in our papers are collections of pixels that are flattened into PDF form and that you can't do anything with. You have to apply a wooden ruler to measure the, the gradient in your graphs. And this is uh, not just a little joke. This is really what is happening on the ground. Here's a research paper that looked at, at 945 cancer patients, most of which died in this uh, process uh, in a chem chemotherapy regime and try to extract if a combinatorial therapy is more effective. And they claimed in this uh, paper that it was. Peter Sorov from MIT tried to do meta or did a meta-analysis uh, with other uh, papers that looked at this combinatorial therapy and, and concluded that there is no actual synergy in this therapy. So this is a very, very different and important outcome. But he said in his paper that he, he had to extract the published kaplan Meyer survival curves by image processing. So he had to reverse engineer, write a script to essentially plot these flattened uh, graphs back to publish a research paper. And that's completely unacceptable if you think the human cost behind a paper like this. So we want to add source data back into our papers. There's the minimally processed data underlying figures. 40% uh, of our papers have that. Now we've done this for many years. Um, so we hope 100% will have it in the future. So please add your proper source data into your papers. Many journals now allow this. But it also allowed us to develop source data up here on the top left, which is a, a data directed search technology um, that, that allows you to find specific uh, experiments in papers and not via the author free text interpretation of the experiment, but directly finds the experiment. And how this works is we have uh, curators um, here in Heidelberg and, and in India that basically annotate the papers um, in correspondence with the authors to, uh, to really um, define is each experiment in a machine readable way. And that allows that then to be open to a search engine. We're trying to um, apply AI technology to this to, uh, to make this process automatic as much as possible, but at the moment it's still human curated. And this, these so-called smart figures then interlink of the paper also, also with the versions of the data deposited on repositories such as by studies. Um, ultimately, we want to develop a, a format where, where the figure panels are portable data packages and can be seen as sort of mini preprints. So every figure panel has, has all the metadata around them to stand alone, including the methods, protocols, also authorship and code, etc., to stand alone. And then you assemble these into a research paper where appropriate, but you can also keep them published as preprints um, where assembly into research paper is not necessary in the future. We've also developed, and this is a uh, work of my colleague, Thomas Limberg, I should say here at EMBO, uh, in a platform called S-Dash, which is essentially the same technology that can be used upstream of journal submission to share science in your trusted network or even beyond that um, as research figures, basically. Uh, so what, what about scientific integrity? Um, we find uh, Anecdotally, and this was something that was really started um, in the biosciences at Rockefeller University um, about 15 years ago uh, and adopted by us 10, um, 10 years ago, we find many issues in uh, not just uh, the text, much less on the text really, but in the figures of papers. So we look at all the figures now pre-publication systematically um, through processes that we call image forensics. So we basically uh, go into Photoshop and apply all kinds of filters. Uh, to see if any manipulation or mistakes were applied. And we call these aberrations because we don't know if there was intent or not. Um, overall, the number is remarkably invariant, although during COVID, it seems to have gone down. So let's see if this holds up. Um, the mistakes and beautification are around 17 to 18% of all post-review papers that are about to be accepted for publication. So that's a really big number, but it has to be said that most of these um, issues can be resolved and only half a percent is uh, papers where we have evidence that uh, fraud happened really so that intentional manipulation happened. These are numbers that are borne out by much, much bigger studies also by Elizabeth Big, for example, manual screen of an incredible 20,000 papers by herself found 4% of 
simple image duplications in figures. So this, the only thing she looked for was duplications. Or Daniel Acuna, who looked uh, uh, programmatically at uh, 2 million papers and found also 1.5% duplications. So uh, one issue with, with, with data is, um, with data manipulation is that it's not just in, in the photographs, in the figures, the micrographs, et cetera, but, but also in the graphs, in the data it's, itself. So here you see just one example of that. It's a beautiful uh, curve that looks like a more review paper or maybe systems biology paper, but it turns out it was a real research paper. We saw p-values on it and it came from a cell biology lab. So we went back and it took three rounds to convince the authors, in this case, very senior uh, cell biologists from New York to actually present the, uh, the real data in a way that is interpretable, which looks like this. And you can immediately see this is not just a cosmetic change, it completely changes how you interact with this data as a reader. And of course, adding the source data to this allows you to replot and do the statistics yourself. Because as it turns out, one of the big issues we see is also um, abuse or ignorance around statistics. And this is often called p-hacking, where we think we have to decorate our data with um, artificial uh, p-values because otherwise the editors will, will auto-reject the paper. Um, this, is, this is really a, a problematic trend. Um, I think statistics are often not taken seriously in biology because the sample size is inherently very small and we should just own, own up to that and say it's simply not feasible to apply um, higher uh, data sets to this data, but it's very misleading to, to, to slap on statistical tests that are not designed for such tiny data sets. So here you see one just dramatic example, but we see many of these actually, where you have a scatter blot and you immediately a visual inspection would show you that it's sort of a nice starry um, night sky without too much trends, but these authors do claim there was a significant negative correlation. Uh, the referee actually got source data reviewed the data and applied uh, his own statistics and said there was no significant correlation. So this shows you why it's so important to share the data. Now, a few points about uh, images. Uh, you see, um, and I think this is just an illustration of why I think there is so many problems. I, I think some authors at least think that, that figures are an illustration of the hypothesis and conclusions they want to share with, with their readers rather than sharing the real data. So just one example here, this is from a, a nice illustration from Journal of Cell Biology where you have a, a naked band. In this case, it's obviously MAP kinase, uh, ERK2, but uh, as you will see, it's much easier to, to write this into the paper in words than, than show this sort of data, which is essentially useless. You see a highly over-contrasted blot here, which at least shows the whole blot. So there's one dominant band, but you don't see much more. And if you change the contrast and show, uh, data in the linear range, you see there's many other bands coming up. These could be proteolytic degradation products, cross direction of the antibody, what have you, but it's important uh, that you have this information uh, because it shows you a, a lot of additional information about the, about the protein in your sample or maybe about the specificity of the antibody before you apply it to immunofluorescence, for example. Here, another example from, from, uh, from a much more serious case, and this is my last example, uh, where you basically uh, probably won't see anything because I only give you one second for this, but with more routine. And if you look at your data critically, you, you will see these things just jumping out at you at some point. In this case, it turns out that for some reason, the scientists use differently X-axis stretched versions of the same mice to, uh, to see an increased cancer load over time. You can see this is exactly the same mouse. It's only a bit fatter in this case, which means it was stretched, not fattened up. Uh, you can see there's three weeks between these. There's more cancer in these, and yet the mouse hasn't moved one, centi one, one millimeter during this whole period, which is a bit uh, hard to imagine. Uh, so, so this is what we would call uh, evidence that something beyond a silly mistake happened. So I would encourage you uh, to, to and th I'm going to switch uh, soon to, to, the, um, to the job part of the talk. Uh, I will encourage you to think about that uh, science um, should be, you have to be very careful about the hypothesis you're trying to support. You have to test your hypothesis. You have to challenge them as best you can. And you have to reject them whenever you see fit. Um, I think we're drifting into this hypothesis forced world where you have two years in a postdoc, you have no chance to fail and you basically are pressured to, to, to get the conclusions that you set out to get. 
Uh, journals are not the scientific police. Um, we get so many samples, but we worry that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think it's a big problem. We have to all be aware of. And to close, I wanted to make the point that, uh, that a lot of the drivers of this problem is research assessment. The role of journals originally is to disseminate archive and quality control, as I mentioned. In the end, we end up unfortunately being more of an academic currency. So that the main aim to publish in a journal like Embo Journal is that it gives you a certain level of academic credit or currency and that gives you job and, and funding. Uh, we launched the San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment uh, six, uh, seven years ago now. Um, and and we, uh, we, we got very good engagement with this. And this is a basic sort of NGO, if you want, to try to, um, to articulate why, why this journal selectivity uh, or this, this academic currency position of journals, and in particular as, uh, as uh, in reinforced with the journal impact factor, uh, which is entirely misleading for the judgment of individuals and individual papers, is, is so toxic. And we're trying to, um, or we're not trying to, we have uh, brought together journals with the funders and research institutes and the researchers in this group to try to have this discussion because it's a closed ecosystem and all these layers have to change at the same time. And now I want to shift briefly to the careers part. And I definitely want to reserve um, about uh, five to 10 minutes at the end for questions. So please write them into the uh, question and answer section. So, uh, what about a career in, 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 in publishing? Um, I hope I showed you this is quite exciting. It's, it's a really important role too. So you, don't, you should not feel this is um, leaving, um, le leaving your intellectual capacities behind or that it's a sort of a hands-off uh, paper pushing job uh, for failed postdocs as some people like to articulate when they get rejected. It's actually an ex extremely intense uh, role as Thiago will also attest to, I hope. Um, that allows you to engage with a really broad set of research rather than focusing on, on one specific specialized area. Of course, in a more shallow way in many ways too. But I want to point out that journal publishing is only a tiny amount of this, although it's a huge amount. So 30,000 scientific journals exist. They all have editors, 2.5 million papers per year published, and this is still growing. But there's a lot more to it. There's uh, the whole curation effort that I briefly mentioned for source data, but there has to be more, much more curation. Here's some of the structured databases that you may use in your research. Um, all of these or many of these have editors. Some of them are more or less curated. Okay. Then we have unstructured databases. These are all set up by journal editors or external editors. Uh, I'm going to jump through because I want to have enough time for peer review, but, but, but in essence, um, as a scientific editor, you sit on the crucial decision of what to review and what to, what to reject before things go to the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, so this is um, the way this works for us is, and, and this is also true at, at, at several other journals, but for us, we, the editor is in charge of their own research papers. They usually have three um, areas of, of, of of research they handle and they will then present um, all but the most obvious decisions at editorial meeting which we have every day at the Embo journal at 2 p.m and you are all welcome to join these meetings we we have these in an open format um, so so please do join if you're interested let me know by email and uh, where necessary we interact with our editorial advisory board so so where we're stuck or where we have specific scientific questions we interact but not for every paper so the editors are really completely in charge of the primary assessment of the science we think it's important to have independent scientific editors do that um, many journals don't have that and i don't want to say that doesn't work also um, but i think it does work quite well with scientific editors because we're trying to really be on the positive side of things and try to publish papers by looking at the data submitted rather than all the extra things that could be added to the paper. We have no stakes in this matter. Often conflicts of interest inherently appear when active scientists are handling research papers. And here's just one example from um, one extremely well recognized re researcher in Europe. Um, there's nothing wrong per se with what he says, but you can see that he realizes himself that it's a bit naughty what he's saying here. Uh, we're also trying to be careful about communicating science in a way that doesn't spin the science and doesn't promise cancer cues in every paper. So a lot of the work is actually um, re reeling back the conclusions in papers, dehyping it. Here are the faces of the editors doing it. They basically uh, handle three new manuscripts per day. They 
don't only hand, handle new manuscripts, they also work on the ethics um, and set uh, standards, uh, policy standards. They edit uh, referee comments, uh, um, sorry, reviews and, and the papers themselves, uh, write summaries about the papers. We also involved in other EMBO activities such as the evaluation of, uh, of EMBO fellowships, which is great, and a number of other activities. Uh, I think I'm going to jump through this. These are some of the things we select for, um, but uh, this goes into too much detail for me now. So uh, as I already mentioned, we handle about three manuscripts a day. What other things do scientific editors do? Here's a little breakdown in terms of the time commitment per day, uh, where they get about one pre-submission inquiry a day, five informal inquiries by telephone or by email. They make about one decision per day, receive about all to one appeals per day about 6% uh, of our papers are appealed. And uh, they do about one uh, acceptance uh, screen or production proce processing interaction, which involves ethics, data, summaries, press release, et cetera, et cetera, uh, per day. They commission about three to five reviews or commentaries per year. They attend these editorial meetings. Uh, they commission for science and society, develop policies um, across the journals involved in transfers, a lot of transfer discussions, 20% of EMBO reports papers are now transfers from EMBO journal. So there's a lot of discussion going on there. We attend a lot of conferences per year in the olden days in person, now a lot on Zoom, um, five to eight. We do lab visits such as I tried to do today and I hope it was useful. Um, and we give talks per year. So here you just see the sort of overall travel of the 16 editors at EMBO press per year, um, by necessity, large in Europe, a lot in the US, and not enough in, in, the, in Asia yet. We, we're ourselves involved in conference organization. Here's just three examples, and this is a slightly old slide now, oops. Uh, but we are basically per year involved in two or three con conference um, this as co-organizers. Uh, we try to uh, work on what's called the front end of the journals by, by um, commissioning um, uh, commentaries on science and society topics. Uh, we also involved in fun other things such as posters, for example, at EMBO, he's seen amazing uh, graphic, which we developed together with, with Silvio Risoli um, on the synapse here. And, and uh, basically this is done by our in-house designer who used to be scientists themselves. So this is another career path you can go for doing scientific design. We do interviews uh, with people. So there's a bit of a media angle, journalistic angle to it. And uh, it's a great job. So you, you get positive feedback. Of course, you end up rejecting a majority of papers, but there's also very positive feedback. You can do many other things um, apart from editing, uh, apart from scientific editing, that's very important. Many editors do, do other things. Reviews, commissioning editors, news and views and commentary editors. Uh, you can go into the journalistic route, um, go into the copy editor route. You can become a data editor or curator, as I mentioned. And then you can go into the more managerial side, which is um, become managing editor of a journal, become the publisher of a journal, um, which is what I'm doing. Um, I'm both the chief editor of Emma Journal and the pub publisher of Embo Press Journals, or you can become the CEO of an organization. And I'm gonna show you just to end a couple of examples of all these type of people. So here, the ones in bold are all people who used to, to be editors, most of them working at Embo uh, Press and they, went on to do various other things after editing. I just want to illustrate that, that editing is not the, the job you may retire on. There's many other things you can do. So Celine, um, I'm just gonna run through them as, as, as examples. Um, first, Andrea Leipfried, I mentioned the journal Life Science Alliance. She basically did a PhD in Tübingen, postdoc at the Curie and Heidelberg, and became editor at the Embo Journal and then at Life Science Alliance as executive editor. So she was essentially the chief editor of Life Science Alliance here with two academic editors of the journal and now moved on to Heidelberg University as the scientific manager of a large research enterprise. Uh, Unfair Nielsen uh, was also a great editor at, at EMBO Journal and did very similar things. She moved um, to become center manager at a new uh, nanoscience center at Aarhus University where she also did her PhD and she did postdoc in Vienna. And then uh, very early on during, uh, after a single postdoc came to the Embo Journal and was a fantastic editor. Uh, Roberto uh, is now in, uh, in San Raffaele in, in Milano, which is a cooperating institution, I think for you. Um, was a very senior scientist, uh, many years at PI in, in Italy, then joined Embo Molecular Medicine as senior editor. 
and uh, became the head of research integrity in San Rafael, where he's been for two years now, I think. Celine uh, was, an, until a very short time ago, until October, in fact, um, senior editor at Ambo Molecular Medicine, a colleague of Roberto's, and now just switched to become a trainer at Ambo Solutions. So training is something uh, fairly new we're doing. It's very exciting. I'm not going to detail, but we are developing training modules on how to write a scientific paper, research integrity, peer review, and, and ec equitable access to research um, through the um, DORA thing I mentioned before. We're also developing new ones on open science and research integrity screening for editors. And finally, and this is my last slide, I want to mention Annette Thomas. Um, she, she was my predecessor as chief editor at uh, Nature Cell Biology and has had really quite exemplary career. So she uh, was a uh, postdoc in neuronal trafficking in Yale in, uh, uh, I dropped the name, sorry, uh, Lab, a, a great co uh, collaborator who, who we talk a lot to, um, and basically became editor and senior editor at Nature, then became chief editor of Nature Cell Biology when it was the launch editor, then became uh, the managing director of Nature Publishing Group, where she expanded it from two journals to over 60 journals during her tenure, um, really a force of nature, then became the CEO of Nature Publishing Group, then the CEO of Macmillan, the parent company of Nature Publishing Group, and became then uh, the Nature Springer board member. Nature Springer acquired Macmillan Publishing, so Nature Springer is one of the top two publishers in the world, uh, and, and then actually left scientific publishing to become um, to join the Yale University Council. You can see the links from her postdoc became apparent, did this for one year and then shifted to become the CEO of Clarivet Analytics, which was then acquired by a Chinese bank, uh, left that and now is the CEO of Guardian Media Group, which publishes some of the most prestigious um, journalism in, in the United Kingdom. So she switched completely to the business side and became really the most or one of the most important uh, business leaders of, of media. So I want to take your questions. I'm sorry if I run a little bit over. Please shoot. Thank um, you very much, Bernd. That was an outstanding presentation. Um, I want to uh, add one small comment for the students and postdocs, which is in, in terms of uh, reproducibility of data and things that you have submitted is you need to keep all your and I can tell you that I, I have seen uh, personally as an editor papers rejected after peer review almost on the way to the press because there were issues about a splice in a gel or something and people could not produce the original data. So your transcriptomic data set, your fax file, your gels, your notebooks, you have to keep all these. And it's perfectly legitimate if you're asked by a reviewer and editor to say, hey, we need to see the source data for X, Y, or Z. And you say, I don't have it. Or the PI says the student left the lab. It's perfectly legitimate not to publish uh, that, that paper, even if it's gone through uh, a very successful peer review process. So please uh, keep all, all your source data. Um, so, and, and maybe uh, just to add to that, Thiago, I think you should also keep it essentially indefinitely afterwards. So there's no reason, I mean, there's almost in, infinite storage capacity now. Um, apart from large data sets and, and high throughput data, of course, but the standard bench science data can be essentially kept indefinitely. I mean, often you've probably all heard of the Papier platform, things can come up years afterwards. And even if it's five to 10 years afterwards, um, if there's doubt about the data because there's clear evidence of image aberrations and you can't prove basically that this is legitimate data, you, you will have problems even after publication. So we have a question here from Tiago Paixão, and the question is regarding smart figures. And Tiago says, eLife recently introduced this in the form of Stencilla documents. Why not the same format? Okay, okay, so that's, that, that's a great question. So, so we are actually uh, collaborating with, with eLife quite a lot on this, and you, you're right, there is a sort of a diversification of different formats that are, that are being used. So, so what we're doing is, is a little bit, uh, it's, it's not a post or diametrically opposed to Sincilla documents at all, but, it, but it's just to form a, a curation exercise, essentially, um, of a, a curation pipeline on the figures we have, um, and, and which, which allows this AI-based search technology to apply to it. We have not translated this into a format that's universal that can be applied to all other outputs from research journals. That's one of the big things across 
the publishing industry that there's a lot of parallel developments and to set standards for these things is extremely difficult. It's almost a full-time job just to set standards. We finally come, and this is just gonna be announced next week, we finally come to a standard, for example, for author checklists, which I didn't cover in this talk. Um, this is again, this is something that took five years, basically, when uh, various journals, Nature, Ember Journal and so on started with author checklists. They were near each other, but were quite divergent. And finally, after five years, we came together and developed a standard. So we, this would take a little bit longer for the, for the data, which is more cutting edge. Um, but thanks for the comment. That's, a, that's some, something I've noted down and, and we will certainly ensure that standards will be arrived at. Because the whole purpose of this is to have something that works across the literature, otherwise it's not useful. Totally agree. Thank you. The next question is from Julia Huntenberg. And since you said most journals make it possible to include data with your paper, why is it not enforced instead? Does EMBO enforce data sharing? Yeah, so, so this, is, this is a good point. Um, we've discussed this a lot and it's an ongoing discussion. Um, we, so, so maybe the preface is that publishing is as competitive as doing research itself. And we have to be sure to remain palatable to authors to come to us. If we, uh, if we become too much top down and, uh, and mandate too many things unilaterally, I think many authors will simply say this is too much hassle. And we hear this feedback quite, uh, quite a bit already. Uh, we've decided to only ask for this data, not at initial submission, because that's when it should really come in so that the referees can see it. We only ask for it at revision stage, because at that point, as I mentioned, we have 95% acceptance rate. So, so in essence, we say to the authors, you will get published if you do revisions properly. And by the way, send us all your source data. And still we get pushback saying, this is uh, it's already a huge amount of work to do the revisions. And now you're even asking for the source data. This is completely crazy. But I do think that's the sweet spot where people are still revising. So they should have all the data in front of them. It should really not be that difficult. What we need, and I was talking to Monica about this uh, earlier, what we need is, is a good interfacing of the e uh, lab book infrastructure in the institutions with the, with the uh, journal submission platforms. Um, that's something we've been toying with for years and it's not really com coming about yet. So, so once it, it, it should really be click of a button rather than a huge new exercise that takes several days. So I think the friction is still very high and that's why we're not mandating. We will mandate as soon as we can. We are already starting to mandate for all quantitative data, uh, including the Kaplan Meyer curves that I showed you as the one example. So there's a few types of data where we will insist, but that's it. It's just a handful of types of data. Thank you, Bernd. Lab books are, are an important topic, although every time I hear about them, I'm reminded of an interview I saw with somebody who had been doing science basically since the 50s. And they said, I had punch tape, I had, uh, I had tape tape, I've had floppy disks, I've had uh, pen drives, and the only data that I can still read is the one in my notebooks uh, throughout my career. Yeah. So, but no, it's a good point. stayed with me for... No, it's true. So, so one amazing thing about cellulose is it really lasts a long time. I mean, papyrus is even better, but, but ba basically this stuff is archivable and no, nobody knows how strong digital archiving really is. We, we, we're trying, but I fear the worst, quite honestly. Um, we have another question from Tiago Pacho. Um, it is, how do you ensure the 30 day to final decision when reviewers may or may not deliver their review? on time yeah yeah okay so that's a very pragmatic question and <clears throat> that's where you need the sort of editor's toolkit and Tiago can comment on this too i'm sure so we have so obviously we we do look at every report that comes in if we find we are in a position to make a decision with less than three referee reports in so that's where we go to three referees there's some redundancy in the system we, we go to three referees because we we need complementary expertise but also so that we have ultimately three reports so we can actually go with if two reports are in and the third one simply sitting on it uh, we obviously send reminders uh, they start being automatic uh, and then they go to personal they start being telephone calls um, and of course we have a database so so in essence what we like to do is to go to at least two referees who we have experience with um, in terms of delivering reports within roughly the timeline we ask and good quality reports uh, with the third person, I'm really trying to encourage the editors to go to a new person because we want to get younger. One of the other sides of the coin is that our referees are all the 
the same old, very experienced people. We want to engage with the, with the early career scientists more, and especially also with, with re uh, researchers in the global south and Asia, where, where we're getting a lot of good submissions from, but have not nearly enough referees. We only have 5% referees from Asia and many more papers. So in, us, so in other words, we, we send reminders, we hope, we call, and we try to go with less than the full complement of referees wherever possible to keep the timeline short. Um, I have a question here from Carmen Santana. Uh, how many review appeals are actually considered positively? Okay, yeah, so I think I briefly mentioned we have about 6% uh, appeals and this is, again, remarkably stable. We don't have a target. It just tends to equilibrate around that every year. Uh, and about 10% of those are averted. And um, they can happen both at the pre-review stage for the editorial rejection or more often the reversals happen at the post-review stage. And often the reversals actually happen. So, th so they essentially they never happen because... Uh, a difference in opinion about the interest of a piece of work. They happen when an author can actually address a point that we thought was unaddressable. So a referee asks for an experiment that we think is beyond the scope and also comes and says, well, we actually had done this already, but we thought we publish a second paper. Why don't we put these papers together? So it's amazing how much data appears magically um, very fast in revision. Um, so, so, so these are the most common repeat reversals, or of course, when the mistake was, was made by, by the referees that slipped through. So please, um, pre please appeal whenever, I have to encourage you to appeal whenever there's a substantive argument to be made. Don't appeal when it's a subjective argument. Is that fair, Thierry? I think so. I, I, that, then I would say you could usually tell if you got a form letter or something about your paper. And my experience is the form letter, which is, is not something great yet, but if it's vague and generic, uh, you don't have, you, I think appeals, in my experience, they succeeded when they had something to sink their teeth into. Either a mistake was made or somebody was overly shitting a, a, a position, but it, 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 it usually was about something specific okay. and not about the novelty or the interest. Uh, I, I, I've never seen one of those succeed, but yeah, as, that's a, that's as a, long as there was a thing you could argue with that was actually about your paper and it wasn't yeah. a paragraph that said, we thank you for your submission and uh, we feel that it's a, a it, everybody's favorite phrase please try a journal a more specialized journal um so that i i think appeals at least in my experience they they work when when they're appealing against something specific for your paper and yeah you know. that's an important point because and, and this is why we are quite nervous initially when we started this policy of being transparent about about the argument the reasons for rejection because we are we are worried that our appeal rate would just go through the roof because you suddenly had all this stuff to sink your teeth in as you say but what's great is that people that the appeal rate did not really change so the people are really pragmatic about about that layer of argument. Uh, so that's great. And the same concern we had with this author pre-consultation because you could argue that's an auto appeal. So we're essentially sending the three referee reports to the authors before you make a decision, right? So, so initially the, the editors at MPress were going, you're completely mad to do this because, because everybody's just gonna argue with you all, all the time and you can't get to new papers. Not happening. It's very, very self-discipline. Self, uh, so it's great. It's working very well. Um, we are out of questions in the box. I, I have one final question. Uh, for, since you mentioned the Surgisphere paper, um, one issue there for me was that uh, a lot of what should have been available was declared confidential, including yes. which, which of those putative hospitals actually had deals, the very nature of where the data would come from. And I, ha I also had experience with my own papers that we could not accept because they said, for example, we have a specific... KRAS inhibitor, but it's proprietary and I can't show you, you the data. And what are what do you consider is acceptable um, yeah, to be right. confidential when a manuscript, particularly for a, a biomedical manuscript? Yeah, so so that's a good point. So on the Suji Fear paper, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, if company's gone, thankfully. So uh, the, the, that was exactly one of the telltale signs that they claimed something like 708 hospitals were were part of this, this platform and they even declared more hospitals than, than South Africa even has uh, were, were part of it. So, so this, there, there was some, so of course the last point wouldn't be clear to an editor, but the sheer number 
was uh, was one telltale sign. The second one was that they said nothing is available, including details about the platform, the data, nothing. It was just essentially a one-liner saying this amazing new resource is really cool, but we're not going to tell you what it is. And 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 this is really where the telltale signs should have been. Um, should have been ringing all, all over the place. So medical literature is really hard because patient confidentiality. So that's what they used as an excuse in that paper. And it is very difficult. It would take too long to discuss here, but it is a big challenge. But the, 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 second, pay, the, 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 the second example that you made about the RAS inhibitor, there we can be brutal and we are brutal. So if somebody has a new inhibitor and they don't give the chemical formula, they're not gonna be published. And we had just this, this year one case uh, which was tragic. It was through peer review, through everything. And they basically got blocked by their lawyers at the company. Um, they, they had to wait for the IP approval, essentially, to, to release that. And we rejected the paper. We didn't publish it. Uh, sorry, we do have one final question, um, which is, again, from Julia Huntenberg, which is, how do you find uh, scientific editor positions? Uh, how, how are they advertised? Oh, um, yeah. How, yeah. How do you hear about them? Yeah, so so definitely, it's advertised. Uh, so so don't just apply without without. Uh, there's a lot of editor positions that always come up. It's very fluid. At Embo, for example, we have nine year maximal contracts, so there's always turnover. So so uh, a lot of the name examples I gave you uh, are not because people are dissatisfied. It's because people are moving on because there's new exciting things to do. Or because the nine years are up. So basically wait for the ad and then and then apply. So it's all very structured. We have a very structured interview format. Uh, if you want, I can talk about that for one second. We also have an internship program, which unfortunately, so our last intern just left yesterday, actually. Uh, yeah, yesterday on Friday, actually. So per year we have two or three different interns. Um, so after COVID, if you're interested in this, you can also come over and try it out for uh, one, two months, basically. Um, if, if you want to know about the interview process, I'm sure I can say something or Thiago can too. Um, go ahead, please. Go, go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, if, you let me know if people get, if, if where well, we can see if people start dropping out so that we can stop. Um, I, I also have to join another meeting in a second. So, so in essence, um, the interview process is again canonical in many journals. We basically, uh, have both a personal uh, level interview. We of course have a very strong pre-selection. We tend to interview ultimately about six people, seven people per position. Um, the interview itself, we basically, um, the interviewee meets all the editors in turn essentially um, to have uh, discussions about science, general science about their own research projects, about publishing motivation and so on in general. Uh, and the second part is what we call a manuscript exercise. Uh, we don't like to call this test because in, in essence, it's, it's an emulation of what you do every day as an editor. You basically get three research manuscripts. You get an hour to read them, which is more constrained than the real life scenario. And then we have an editorial meeting and discuss them. And that's actually the big decis decisive factor. And then in the end, we have a talk. The, the editor talks about their research. Uh, the aspiring editor talks about their research. And that takes the whole day. Yeah, I would add that one 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 important thing that surprising needs to be said is if you're applying for a position at a journal is you should become familiar with the content of that journal and, and what it publishes. That's useful. Um, and, and I can tell you these these manuscript tests, for example, I've been on both ends of, of them and, and they did call them tests. Um, and what you try to do is shake people up a little bit. So you don't, if you worked on regulatory T cells and inflammation, you're not going to get a test manuscript on regulatory T cells and inflammation. So it, it pays to, to know the range of what the journal publishes. Some journals advertise positions by field, immunology, neurology, some of them are just scientific editors, like as, as was the case, for example, with Med. So you should uh, take the time to know the range of what the journal is doing um, and, and, and be prepared, be familiar with, with the journal, which a lot of people weren't when yeah. they, they knew their favorite papers from the journal, but they didn't take time to look at, now you're applying to work at the journal. You're not submitting a, a manuscript in your field to the journal. So I would take the time to, to browse uh, the journal broadly. And maybe one quick point. Many people are concerned that, that English language skills are a huge issue. So of course you have to, you, you will be also tested on communication skills. So we make people write the small news and views. 
um, but, but you don't need to be a native speaker, um, as you can see from me and Thiago anyway. <laughs> but uh, it does help to communicate. So Thiago, for example, writes a lot now and, and you, you will write a lot as an editor. So you, those skills are important, but you don't have to be a native speaker. And most of your work is not writing published stuff. It's, it's essentially communicating with authors on research papers, unless you go for one of the other positions I mentioned. There's not just scientific editors. I would say scientific editor is a great entry point for many people from the bench because that's the nearest to your research. But uh, there's really exciting positions outside of that. The whole range from copy editor, which is language based, to journalists basically, where, you, where you're really writing stuff all the time. And many of these came in through the bench, basically. They, they became journalists later. Yeah, I mean, uh, at the Champagne Mobile, one, for example, in, in Zhu Cost, who became basically a professional uh, graphic designer for, for scientific publication and does absolutely amazing work. Yeah, Came so from a graphic, PhD in neuroscience at the, at the Champagne Mobile. That's probably the most exciting job of all, the graphic, scientific graphic design. That's the future. That's going to be huge. There's some fantastic designers out there, and that's a really fun job. Yeah. Okay. So, Thank you very much, Bert. Um, please, uh, um, Laura has asked me to remind everyone that there will be a feedback forms uh, circulated. And if later, if you have questions that occur to you or if you want to get in, in touch with Bert, uh, please let us know. Thank you, everybody, but especially thank you, Bert. Thank you very much, Tiago, other Tiago, not me in the uh, <laughs> Royal Delusional who set up the everything informatic in this session. And, and thank you all for participating. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone.